Okay, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor G, and today we're going to continue our discussion, uh, building off of what we talked about last time, uh, the English and the, uh, not just the English, but the European Enlightenment. Uh, today what we're going to be kind of narrowing in on is the English Enlightenment, and the English, then the Enlightenment philosophers that most heavily influence uh, the early, uh, the American founding fathers that most influence them philosophically speaking, uh, that have the biggest impact on how they view politics, um, the biggest impact on the relationship between, as far as they're concerned, the relationship between the government and the people, what the best sort of relationship. Uh, is what the government's responsibilities are, what the people's responsibilities are. All of these ideas they are going to borrow heavily from the philosophy of John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. We're going to talk about Thomas Hobbes first, and then move into a discussion of Locke. So, Thomas Hobbes is a 17th century Oh, we have a little bit more background information. This is just building off of what I was discussing earlier. Um, and this, all of this is important because the American Revolution, you hear a lot about the uniqueness of America and how special America is, um, what historians call American exceptionalism, the idea that we are somehow unique as a country, that we're somehow unique as a people. And this is perhaps overstated quite a bit, overstated in popular culture. But with the American Revolution, we do have something very unique that happens as far as what sort of government is instituted, as far as what the Founding Fathers believed concerning government. This is a very unique aspect of American history. So. The American Revolution represents a historically unique moment, specifically in political history, as far as the uniqueness of the government that's established and the uniqueness of the philosophical system behind that government, as far as views of liberty, property, and individual freedom are concerned. Out of the Enlightenment of era philosophers, who I mentioned before, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, are almost universally agreed to have the biggest impact on um, revolutionary thought in America. Uh, in fact, even though they're English, right, even though um, John Locke's English, he's known as the American philosopher um, because his work specifically is going to have a monumental impact uh, especially when it comes to, for example, the writing of the Declaration of Independence, as we'll see later. Jefferson borrows uh, heavily, almost, you know, almost uh, if one of you, for example, borrows as heavily from, um, as, borrows from, as Jefferson borrows so heavily from uh, John Locke, if one of you did something similar on your test, I would accuse you of plagiarism. This is how heavily Jefferson borrows from Locke. So this is why Locke is known as the American philosopher, because he's so influential on the early founding fathers. Okay, so let's, let's move back again to talking about Thomas Hobbes. Uh, and the reason why Hobbes is important, so I said Locke is known as the American philosopher. Well, Locke is drawing heavily from this gentleman here, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, some of Locke's most key ideas, especially the idea of a state of nature and how the government arises out of this state of nature. Um, most of these ideas Locke gets from Hobbes. Now, he, he improves upon them, or if you don't want to use the word improves, um, he changes them, he, he deviates from Hobbes' original idea, he adds new elements to it, but nevertheless he owes his general framework to Hobbes. So again, Hobbes is a 17th century English philosopher, now widely regarded as one of the earliest and one of the greatest political philosophers of the Enlightenment, uh, best known for his works uh, including The Elements of Law, um, The Citizen, and the work that we are going to be focusing on is Hobbes's Leviathan. 
Hobbes' intention within these works can be seen, um, there, there's two primary principles driving Hobbes' work. Um, first of all, Hobbes believed that virtually any government would be better um, than civil war. And we'll, we'll get to why this is. But Hobbes basically viewed government as a good thing, a good and necessary thing. Let me go back, because I think I skipped a slide here. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to these two principles. I kind of jumped forward there. Um, first of all, what Hobbes was seeking to do was to put moral and political philosophy for the first time on a scientific basis. So last time when we talked about the Enlightenment, I talked about the um, progress that science was making. I talked about how, um, how science was going leaps and bounds in the era of Enlightenment with the Copernican Revolution. Right? Copernicus is followed by Kepler, who improves upon his planetary laws of motion then by Galileo, who kind of makes, brings Copernicanism to the masses, and then Newton, who kind of unifies all of, he unifies celestial and terrestrial uh, astronomy. Uh, he's able to explain motion both on Earth and in the heavens using one unified theory. So people see the success of natural science and they're wanting to apply it to other areas. Specifically, in the case of Hobbes, he's wanting to give political science a scientific basis. He wants to get to the root of political philosophy to see sort of what makes it tick. Right? So he's applying this scientific analysis to politics. What Hobbes also wants to do is contribute to the establishment of civic peace. Hobbes believes that if he can figure out how government works, then he can fix existing governments. Right? If you figure out the ideal model that a government should abide by, um, then you can apply this fix to existing governments around you. So he wants to uh, establish of a civic peace. Um, and disposing humanity towards fulfilling their civic duty to teach us what it is to be responsible citizens. To not only figure out what's wrong with government, the structure and the institution of government, but to figure out what we can do and what we ought to do as good citizens. So in this respect then, um, Hobbes believes that the government, that government in general, uh, is good. That government serves a specific purpose, that it's there for a reason, and that it is, in some sense, necessary. Necessary for, not necessary for our survival, but necessary for us to flourish as human beings. Um, the government and the, establish, uh, the establishment of government can only produce good things for human society by providing, as we'll see, by providing stability. Okay, so it, according to Hobbes, any form of government, no matter uh, if it's a monarchy or a dictatorship or a communist government or democracy, any form of government is better than no government and is better than civil war, better than people constantly fighting against each other. Okay. Um, Hobbes is dissatisfied with traditional political philosophy. Uh, the political philosophy, for example, that we see in the writings of Plato and in the writings of Aristotle. What Hobbes is dissatisfied with, so I said that he's trying to apply this a sort of scientific method to politics. What Hobbes sees when he reads classical political philosophy, such as Plato and Aristotle, what he sees is that both Plato and Aristotle, yes, they do come up with political philosophies. Yes, they are telling us what this, uh, the ideal form of government should be and how we as citizens should be ask, uh, acting. But their political philosophy is so far removed from how people actually are, says Hobbes, that it's just too impractical. Um, it's too idealistic. Both Plato and Aristotle 
um, frame their political philosophy in an ideal world. In a world in which everyone's a good citizen, in which everyone's willing to cooperate with each other. And so Hobbes says that this is, is, this is practically speaking, um, is just too idealistic. The, the context of their political philosophy is too idealistic. So what Hobbes wants to do, instead of building sort of a top-down approach to political philosophy, Hobbes is going to begin by lowering the standards, by beginning from the most base state of human existence, what he calls the state of nature. So he's going to begin his discussion then do that. He's going to begin his discussion talking about humanity, how humanity finds itself uh, before government. Okay, and again, this is a this is a thought experiment. This is not. Um, he's not trying to comment on any historical reality. He's not pointing to a specific time and place in history and talking about it as a state of nature. Uh, so in philosophy, you have um, various thought experiments. And so this is meant to get us thinking about the sort of how and why government was started. So Hobbes asks a general question. What would the condition of humanity be if there were no civil society? What would our condition be if there were no government? How would people relate and react to each other? To answer this question, Hobbes makes a few assumptions about us. Hobbes assumes that people are, um, how to put it nicely, that people are innately selfish, that people are innately greedy, and perhaps most importantly, the reason why they are innately selfish and greedy, because human beings, the sort of one um, universal aspect that defines us in the state of nature is that we are all out for our own survival, that we are all out for self-preservation. Self-preservation and the idea of self-preservation is going to play a very fundamental role within Hobbes's philosophy. Perhaps we might best imagine that people might fare best in such a state, in such a state that they're kind of left alone without government, when, without any external laws being, implied, uh, uh, being imposed upon them, where each person decides for him or herself how to act and is judged over their own individual actions. So that way when any dispute arises, the individual himself handles it without any appeal to any recognized authority. Without any appeal to um, the police or any sort of judge, any sort of legal system. In this state, and because of that, Hobbes describes each person as seeking their own self-preservation. State of nature where a person's liberty is that person's right to preserve him or herself, to protect him or herself. And this is what Hobbes calls the right of nature. The right of nature is our um, indubitable right, our inherent right to seek out our own self-preservation. Hobbes terms this the right of nature and the condition of mere nature, when, if you, when you do your readings, if he says the condition of mere nature, he's referring here to the state of nature. The state of perfectly private judgment in which no agency is recognized as an authority. And the only law in the state is the law of self-preservation, the right and the liberty to preserve ourselves. This is the right to do whatever one sincerely wishes. Okay, because the problem with self-preservation is you run into a predicament. And how I like to describe the state of nature, I, I think I mentioned this in the last video, is think of your favorite uh, post-apocalyptic world. Uh, my favorite post-apocalyptic world is The Walking Dead. 
right? They're existing in the universe, in this, in this world uh, where there's, the government has collapsed, uh, there's no more police, and it's just kind of every man out for himself. Initially speaking, if I'm by myself, I'm seeking out my own self-preservation. So initially that may mean that I'm out to find food and water, but once I start interacting with other people, once my social situation becomes more and more complex, I start to apply this principle of self-preservation to other situations. For example, in The Walking Dead, once they start meeting other groups, there arises these really complex social scenarios. Um, should we let these members in to our group? Uh, should we kill this person who has attempted to harm us? And so what uh, Hobbes says then is that this law of self-preservation um, is gradually and gradually extended to the point where I'm no longer just talking about my own immediate survival, but I'm planning ahead, right? I'm doing premeditated attacks. Because even though this person doesn't present a threat to me now, one day in the future, they might present a threat. As a result of this, I can act to eliminate them out of self-preservation. But it's, uh, it's not related to my immediate self-preservation. So in this, thing, in this sense, then, Hobbes says that within the state of nature, everything is interpreted by the individual. There's no overarching sense. There's no overarching sense of morality. Okay, there's, no, there's really no right and wrong because, according to Hobbes, this principle of self-preservation can be applied and reinterpreted in a variety of different circumstances and can justify an almost endless number of actions. Okay, also, according to Hobbes, this state of nature that... Um, so again, picture some post-apocalyptic society. This state of nature where there's no structured police force, where there's no government, Hobbes says that um, inevitably this is going to be a state of war. Okay. The right of each thing to all things, the, the right of the natural right we have for self-preservation invites serious conflict. Um, using the example I gave before, perhaps this person isn't right now, perhaps they're not trying to take my food, but one day in the future they may. Or perhaps I might need that person's food. So inevitably, says Hobbes, this leads to, uh, this leads to conflict. There's no way around it. Especially if there are competition for limited resources. Especially if we are competing for food and water or desirable goods. People will naturally, according to Hobbes, people naturally fear each other. People are afraid of strangers. They're afraid of other groups outside their own. So they're naturally going to apply suspicion and they're naturally, naturally going to be hostile towards these individuals, right? By invading them, by rationally planning to strike first and not waiting on that other group to strike, even if you don't know their intentions, right? You assume that they're going to come after you. In this situation, since there's, there's no common authority to appeal to and any serious dispute that arises is typically handled with violence. Okay, so we talked about the state of nature. We talked about the state of nature being primarily a state of war due to each individual looking out for himself and not having to abide by any sort of law. Now we're going to talk about the, the general laws of nature. Hobbes argues that the state of nature is a miserable state of war. People are constantly at each other's throats. They're constantly competing for resources. Um, so it's a constant state of war in which none of our important human ends are realized. Okay, we can't get anything done if we're constantly trying to kill each other. No progress is ever made. Right? You can't build up your community and build up your society if you're constantly fearing for your life, if you're constantly fearing invasion. So Hobbes says that naturally, not only naturally, but happily, 
we will submit ourselves to external laws. We will limit our freedoms. We will give up our individual right for self-preservation in exchange for overarching laws that everyone has to abide by. Hobbes argues that each of us as rational beings can see that while we are at war of every man for himself, um, that this isn't going to bring about satisfaction for anybody and that peace is innately good and therefore also um, we have our way to peace. Our way to peace being to agree upon to come together and to form a society in which there are these um, mutually accepted laws. That we're willing to seek peace with others in order to get rid of the state of war. In order to um, get rid of the violence that is inherent to this state of nature. So this inevitably, according to Hobbes, this inevitably leads to the establishment of what Hobbes calls a sovereign authority. Essentially what he's saying is that this leads to the establishment of government. This leads to somebody being recognized as a power. That the people get together and in order to get out of the state of nature, they agree to put somebody in charge over them to protect them and to ensure peace. That way they can get on with their lives, right? And that way they're not constantly worried about somebody attacking them or somebody threatening them. When threatened by a conqueror, the people naturally promise obedience to the sovereign that they have established, right? Um, so now it's not just every man for himself, but now we recognize, now uh, self-preservation is kind of tied to the community as a whole. When a threat is presented to us, once we are established, it's not just a threat to me, but it's a threat to the peaceful society that I inherit, inhabit, sorry. Political legitimacy, according to Hobbes, therefore... Um, does not depend upon how a government came to power, but only upon whether it can effectively protect those who have constructed it. Whether or not it can protect the people who have, by their own rational will, consented to the government's power, consented to be subjects and not rulers. So the, the obligation then of the government is to protect the people because this is the only reason why people agree to government in the first place is to have um, a more overarching protection allow allowing them to establish a peaceful society. So this is the, uh, almost the sole purpose of government, what it's there for. So Hobbes says it doesn't matter what type of government it is. It doesn't matter if it's a monarchy or democracy, right? All that matters according to Hobbes is, well, according to Hobbes, everyone prefers any form of government over the state of nature. Because as we've seen, the state of nature uh, is violent. It's constant war against each other. So anyone would prefer any sort of government over that, over returning to the state of nature. Okay, so... Let's talk now about John Locke. So again, John Locke's coming after Hobbes. And he's building upon Hobbes. He makes a lot of the same points that Hobbes does, but he's going to change some important aspects. Perhaps the most central concept in Locke's political philosophy is his theory of natural law and his theory of natural rights. The natural law concept existed before Hobbes. We saw it, or sorry, existed before Locke. We saw it evident and um, loosely evident in the writings of Hobbes. And it's a way that natural law, what it comes to mean for Hobbes, natural law is a way of expressing certain truths, certain obligations. Not necessarily moral obligations. There's no... Um, Hobbes doesn't tie morality into this. 
it, it's a way of, it's, it's obligations that are applied to all people regardless of whatever particular place they live or whatever political arrangements they have. Natural law is the law that is common to all despite what sort of government that they may live under. Natural law is also distinct from divine law, right? Divine law being the law given by God. Uh, if you're familiar with the monotheistic traditions of the West, such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, divine law are the commandments given by God. Right? In the Old Testament, this comes in the form of God's commandments at Mount Sinai to the Jewish people. These are ways you ought to behave by God himself. Divine law, uh, kind of conversely speaking, divine law is something that any rational, rational reasonable person um, can figure out just by examining himself and by examining his own nature. So this is why Locke argues that people have certain rights. They have these natural rights. And these natural rights, as we'll see, is the right to life. This is picking up on the idea of self-preservation that we saw in Hobbes. The right to life, liberty, and unique to Locke is he introduces this idea of the right to property that are the foundation um, independent of the laws of any particular society. According to Locke, these rights are what any and all government ought to ensure because these rights are natural to us. And these natural laws can be derived from reason alone. Okay, so Locke's uh, central thesis can be summed up in the following way. So we, we've seen how he's kind of borrowed from Hobbes in a sense, but this is, this is essentially what Locke is saying in his entire treatise of government. This is, the selection you're going to be reading is from Locke's two treaties of government. Okay. Locke has this to say, all government is limited in its power and exists only by the consent of the governed. And the ground that Locke builds on is this, that all people are born free. So all government is limited in its powers. It can only do so much. It can only impose so many laws on the people. And the only reason why government exists in the first place is because we agree that it exists. Government is a socially constructed reality. Now, this may be kind of weird to think about, but the only reason why government has power, the only reason why, for example, I like to give the example of speeding tickets, right? Everybody hates speeding tickets. The only reason why you were obligated to pay your speeding ticket is because you accept the reality of that speeding ticket. You accept that it has some sort of power, some so sort of um, economic and political sway over you. We as a people, for example, if everyone woke up tomorrow and said, yeah, I'm no longer paying speeding tickets, okay, what would happen? They can't take everybody to jail. Okay, the only reason why these laws and institutions have power is because we as a people agree that they have power. We accept their authority. Furthermore, says Locke, everyone, everyone, despite their race, despite their religion, despite their geographical place of birth, everyone, according to Locke, is born free. We are all born free. We only lose this freedom when government oversteps its bounds. Okay? So we're all born free, and the only time this is lost is when a government steps in and says, no, you're not, you now belong to me. Okay. Let's move on again to talk about this idea of natural law and natural rights found in Locke. So again, natural law, natural rights are probably some of the most important concepts in Locke. And again, he's building off of the writing of Hobbes. Let's see here. So according to Locke, 
Um, the law of nature can be stated in two ways. According to Locke, um, natural law can, can be formulated. Okay, this is where uh, he's kind of moving beyond Hobbes. So Hobbes talks about the law of preservation. Locke makes it clear. Okay? These are the two ways in which, the law, in which natural law can be stated, according to Locke. Every person is obligated to preserve themselves. This is the law of preservation. And then Locke builds on this. Every person is obligated to preserve all of humanity, not just themselves. Every person is obligated to preserve themselves, and every person is obligated to preserve all of humanity. Now that seems like a bit of a jump there. Probably <laughs> seems to you like he's, he's taking, he moves from the individual to everybody, right? And you might say, whoa, 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 slow down a bit. I'm not obligated to anybody outside of my immediate family. But what Locke is saying here, and as we'll see, okay, Locke accepts this idea of the state of nature. And what Locke is going to say is that as a society, once we have agreed to form a society, once we have agreed to the dominion of government, we're not only acting to protect ourselves, but as I said before, we are now acting to preserve this peace that we have found, this um, social stability. Okay, we don't want to go back to that state of nature. So this is what he means when he says we're now obligated to preserve all of humanity. This is what Locke has to say concerning that point. Everyone, as he is bound to preserve himself, and not to quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought he as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind, and may not, unless it be to do justice on an offender, take away or impair the life of what tends to the pres preservation of life, liberty, health, limb, or goods, of another. So we must act to preserve not only our life, but the life of everybody else. Because if we act to harm somebody, we are taking away that person's natural rights. This is why it's wrong. This is why it's wrong to, according to Locke, right, why it's wrong to take somebody's livelihood away. Why it's wrong to take justice into your own hands and physically harm somebody because you are stepping in on that person's most basic right, their right for self-preservation. So according to Locke then, there's a connection that we see between self-preservation and the obligation to the other, the obligation that I have to other people. Okay, so let's move on to talk about what Locke means when he talks about the state of nature. So at first, at first glance, Locke's notion of the state of nature seems pretty straightforward. This is what he has to say. Locke writes, Want or lack of a common judge with authority puts all persons in a state of nature. Men living according to reason without a common superior on earth to judge between them is properly the state of nature. So essentially, he's accepting the definition that Hobbes put forward of a state of nature. People living without government rule. People living in a state in which there are no external laws placed upon them. This is what he means by a state of nature. So on this account, a state of nature is, again, is distinct from any sort of political society where a legitimate government exists and from a state of war where men fail to abide by the law of reason. Locke's state of nature then is of men living together peacefully. Men living together, um, well not necessarily peacefully, but men agreeing to live within the same vicinity of each other, kind of at the first stages of humanity, before civil society, enjoying natural freedom and equality and an atmosphere of peace and goodwill. So here you start to see the difference between Hobbes and Locke. So remember, 
What does Hobbes has to say about a state of nature? According to Hobbes, a state of nature is a constant state of war, a constant state of everyone seeking to, the, you know, they're applying, they're misapplying, the right of self-preservation to eliminate the other, to take somebody's goods, because eventually, um, you know, you're going to have to obtain these goods. So we might as well act now, right? This state of constant back and forth violence. But according to Locke, that's not so. State of nature isn't inherently violent, isn't inherently evil, um, because according to Locke, right, the only time that this evil actually comes about is when government interferes in nature. It's when we impose these artificial boundaries. Okay, so if you look at, for example, something like the Atlantic slave trade, um, we'll talk about this a bit once we get closer to talking about the Civil War, but look at the Atlantic slave trade. Locke says, by definition, all men are free. The only reason why we have slaves, the only reason why these people are taken away from their homes is because some government thought that it would be a good idea, um, well, some government realized that they can make money off of these people, that they can make money off of owning another human being as property. So Locke sees, Locke kind of pictures the state of nature in an almost idealistic sense, right? It's not the state of war. Okay, men living together in peace, uh, kind of at the first stages of humanity before the advancement of civil society. We've already discussed this. Okay, and again, the state of nature exists uh, without reference to any form of government, any sort of political uh, experience of the individuals. Okay, so let's get into another very important aspect of Locke's philosophy. And this aspect of Locke's philosophy is something that you don't see in Hobbes, something that Hobbes never quite picks up on. So Locke's treatment of property, his, his philosophical discussion of what property means and its relation to government, is, is thought to be one of his most unique contributions to political thought. And it's also as a result, one of the most heavily debated and heavily criticized. Locke's discussion of property is based on a theological assumption. The theological assumption comes from Christianity. So this is uh, 17th, 18th century England. Uh, most people at the time are Christian, uh, either Catholic or Protestant. And the assumption that Locke is operating off of is that, uh, if you can recall, um, the, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates humanity. And he gives human beings dominion over the world. He sort of puts people in charge of the earth to take care of it, to protect it, and to get their livelihood from it. So the theological assumption that Hobbes begins with is that humanity in general has been given the world, has been given physical property, has been given the land as the land is a gift from God that we have been put in charge. Okay? So in the book of Genesis, God gives everyone the land. Well, I mean, there's only two people, Adam and Eve, but he gives them the land. He doesn't say, he doesn't later on say, okay, um, you get the land, but you don't. I mean, he does give Israel a special place in the land, but he doesn't, for example, say that Israel has control of all the land or that they ought to have control of all the land. So Locke is operating on this theological assumption that everyone has a right to property. Everyone has a God-given right to the land, to make a living off of the land. This is what God in the book of Genesis commands us to do. So according to Locke, nobody has originally a private dominion exclusive of the rest of mankind in any of them as they are thus in their natural state. So no one person has some inherent or innate right to more land than any other person, right? regardless of where they come from, regardless of their race or religion or national identity, right? We all have 
equal access, equal right to the land, equal right to property. Furthermore, every person not only has the right to property, not, you know, not only has the right to the land, but also has their right to their own labor. So we all have an equal part of what is common to us all, that's our labor, but we also own, or sorry, we, also, we all have an equal part of what is common, that's the land, and we also have the inherent right to our own work. By working, we are in essence claiming whatever we are working on as our own. Okay, so if I labor, if I work to plant corn seeds, when those corn seeds grow, I view those corn seeds as mine. I planted them, I have the right to them. I can sell them if I want to, I can eat them if I want to, I can do whatever. But since I put forth the effort, since I put forth the labor, they're mine. So every person not only owns his own person, but also his labor, which is the immediate extension of the person. Locke has this to say, the labor of his body and the work of his hands, we say, are properly his. The property which every man in his own person and in his own labor is the original and natural property. It is the foundation of all other property in the state of nature. As a result, so we have here that property is a combination of what is private, our labor, and what is common, the land. So we use what is common, and by working on it, by using what is private, our labor, and working on what is common, we produce something that is ours, something that belongs to us. Okay, so how does government come into play? Here Locke's going to say that by their labor, okay, by human beings working the land, by their inventions, by their art, by their technology, by their willpower, human beings make increase possible we have now are able to create a surplus and thereby solve the most basic economic condition that we find ourselves in. And here there is some historical, um, there is some, there is a historical time period that we can look at. Um, and Locke doesn't explicitly state this, but I think this is generally what he had in mind. So around 12,000 years ago, uh, 10,000 BC. If this was uh, World History One, we would start off our class with this. Around 10,000 BC, a fundamental shift in the human condition takes place. Probably one of the most important events in history. Um, this is what's known as the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution. What happens during the Neolithic Revolution is a shift from a hunting and gathering based society to an agriculture based society. Now hunters and gatherers, they basically are able to collect enough sustenance for the day. Um, sometimes you have a little bit of surplus, for example if you have a successful hunt, if you go out and are able to kill a deer, you have a surplus of meat that may last for a few days. But typically speaking, the food that you're able to gather by hunting and gathering is enough to last you for that day. That's why you have to do it, wake up and do it every single day. This is why hunters and gatherers are constantly on the move. This is why they're nomadic, because they're going from place to place to place in search of more food. If you stay in one place too long, you run out of food, so you have to keep moving. Now what happens worldwide, this happens all over the globe, from ancient Mesopotamia to ancient Egypt to China to India to South America, what happens is that around 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BC, human beings undertake the 
the Neolithic Revolution starts. The Neolithic Revolution is defined by two things. First of all, we have the agricultural revolution, and second of all, we have the pastoral revolution. And the agricultural revolution is defined by the growth of crops. The Somewhere along the line, somebody realized that if you plant a seed in the ground, eventually that seed will produce whatever plant um, that you got the seed from. So this leads to plant domestic, uh, domestication. It leads to regular crops, right, and predictable crops. You know that if you plant your seed uh, at a particular time, that eventually you'll be able to harvest at another time. What also happens is the pastoral revolution. Uh, pastoral meaning uh, relating to the herding of animals. Animals are domesticated, uh, specifically cattle, sheep, and goats, and also dogs, but mainly cattle, sheep, and goats, right? Um, animals that are able to be kept in herds. With the agricultural revolution and with the domestication of animals, what you have for the very first time is the built, building up of surplus supplies. If you have a good year in your crops, you have enough food to not only last you through the winter, but also into the spring. So this is what Locke is talking about, that human labor, right? Going out and herding animals, going out and planting your crops makes increase possible makes increase possible. And for the first time, we have a surplus. Now, anytime you have a surplus, what inevitably happens, with a surplus in food, you get a population spike. More food equals more babies, right? Because now you can support more children. Now you can actually feed your children. So more food equals more babies. More babies your small village transforms into a small town, and your small town eventually transforms into a city. So more food, population increase, population increase centered on a specific area, centered in the city. This inevitably leads to some administration problems. What are you going to do with all these people? How are you going to manage these resources? How are you going to determine who gets to use the water and at what time they get to use it? So this increase then leads to the formation of an administrative system, leads to the formation of a government. Men, according to Locke, men and women are thus quickly driven into society for the protection of their property. Right, because if I'm going to sit here and grow crops all day, I need to be assured that I'm going to be protected. I need to be assured that some angry mob isn't going to come through and eat all my crops. I need to be assured that I'm going to be able to grow my crops, I'm going to be able to support my family, and that I'm going to be able to earn some extra income in this. So all of this, according to Locke, leads to the formation of government in the formation of civil society. Now, so this final step in this long process is the liberation of humanity's powers of increase from the restraints of nature. And this liberation comes in the form of government. So Locke's theory of property explains the necessity from the transition from a state of nature to a civil society. Now Hobbes says that this is done primarily out of fear. Fear is the primary motivator for Hobbes, right? Men are afraid of each other, they're afraid of constant violence, they're afraid of constant war, so they come together and agree that they're going to make peace. And they're going to make peace by agreeing to live in society together. Hobbes, uh, Locke has a different approach. According to Locke, it is material increase that results from people's labor that eventually leads to government, that eventually leads to the formation of civil society. So, this is again Locke. People are quickly driven into this society. Government is formed. Okay, so political society for Locke is the opposite of the state of nature. 
it's designed to remedy certain defects that is found. To ensure the protection of private property, right, the, the work of my labor, the fruits of my labor, to, to ensure the protection of private property, to judge controversies, to judge disputes that we may have between each other, and to and the power to punish offenders. People have to realize that there are consequences for their action, that you can't just run around doing whatever you want to. Okay, so now we have a presentation of kind of the general philosophies of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and I hope this helps as you're reading the text, and I will speak with you guys later.